Good evening again, my friends. You know, the natural man, when he operates through his rational mind, or as the Bible would term it, his soul, is always preoccupied about two things, his provision and his protection. And in this respect, he is always looking to know what needs to be done, how can it be done, and can he do it. In short, the natural man relies on no one but himself for the understanding of what needs to be done and for the methodology to do it and for the power by which it will be done. These three things are called, my friends, in the word the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eye, and the pride of life. And they are given this strong label, lust, because these uncontrolled urges blind a man to everything else. When you lust after something, you go beyond all reasonableness, beyond all restraint. It is what you will do if you are unimpeded in the process. So when the word talks about the lust of the flesh and the lust of the eyes, it's not talking about sexual desire and just pure pleasure. It's talking about the impulsion, the uncontrollable impulsion towards the thing you consider most worthy of your time, your effort, your reputation and everything else you possess. And there are only two things that the mind of the natural man finds worthy of that kind of single-minded, unobstructed devotion. The one is provision, food and shelter, and the other is protection, safety. It's what Adam and Eve reached for in the garden after they had picked the fruit. Their eyes were opened and they were immediately concerned about how they would provide for themselves clothing to wear and how they would protect themselves. <laughs> In fact, they ended up hiding from God as their only form of protection. To the soul, these lusts are the, the ultimate goal of life and therefore they justify every activity in the pursuit of them. Now because of this, Satan, who understands us very well, has crafted a set of schemes meant to take complete and total advantage of these exact things. The more you run after these goals, the more Satan pulls you toward them with the crumbs that he has crafted. These things are summarized in the word schemes because a scheme has a specific intent to take complete advantage of one's blindness and since lust is the perfect description of blindness then the scheme is the appropriate response to that degree of blindness. Now these schemes are called the world and of the world in the Bible. Satan has put together a series of schemes meant to address every form of need for the provision and the need for protection. Every way you can think of a need for provision and protection and every need for these things that you can think of are the systems and schemes that Satan has put in place in this world. The compendium of these systems is what the Bible refers to as the world. It's a scheme to take complete advantage of the human desire for food, shelter and safety. And the possession with these desires is biblically, biblically manifested in the term lust. The lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes and the pride of life. It beholds before humans the illusion that you can become God. You can be your own God, knowing good and evil. You can decide for yourself. You can provide for yourself. 
you don't have to depend upon anyone else. God, on the other hand, seeks to make us understand that there is a greater way and that the purpose of our creation was that we might be transformed from this fleshy estate of inferiority to a sovereign estate of a divine nature. This transformation, this transformation, my friends, involves nothing short of the presence of the person of God himself within the man. And in accordance with his plan, God gave us a spirit as well as a soul. And when the time comes for God to draw us up to him, he comes to us in that way, spirit to spirit. The nature of this transaction is that God in the spirit will overcome our obsessions, our lusts, this uncontrolled lusting for provision and protection. And the three fatal lusts they engender together, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eye, and the pride of life. And as these most basic instincts of the natural man are finally put away, it is, as our Lord said, as a death, the old man dying away as we await the new man of the Spirit. You see, my friends, trusting God is that form of death and dying of the flesh. When the Spirit of God, then the Spirit of God, will meet you in that place of death that he has brought on and he will give you a new life, a new vision, and a new understanding. He will open to your spirit the impulses of the Spirit of God. Now with this new understanding, you are suddenly a new creature. You've gone from the darkness of being governed by your soul and with that, the enslavement to the schemes and systems of the enemy. You've gone from the kingdoms of the world into the kingdom of God. God translates you then from the powers, from the control of principalities, powers, and rulers of darkness of this world, from all malevolent forces of the heavenly realms. He transforms you from one subject to the world's control to someone who is now led by the Spirit of God. And he continues this transformation in you day by day, moment by moment. And the nature of the transformation is that you stop being governed by what you need in the way of provision and protection. You stop being governed by that and by the impulsiveness of being provided for in terms of food, shelter, safety through your own single-minded devotion. As you are going through this transformation, the things that replaces these lusts, these impulses, these extreme impulses, the thing, the thing that replaces them for your direction and for the strength by which you will pursue them is, my friends, the spirit of the living God. And he begins to speak to your spirit and he begins to tell you of an entirely different way to live, not looking merely for what you will eat and what you will drink, but a life, a walk of trust, trust in the living God. Now to the average person, this is silliness, <laughs> silliness in spades, but in this war, my friends, that we have now been thrust smack into the middle of, it is the only way to escape the attraction of the world and the entrapment that it produces. Because you see, Satan, he has no way of anticipating what you are going to say or do if your response is by the Spirit. And more than that, if your response is by the Spirit, Satan knows that God will rise up and act in your defense. Because if you put your trust in him, God will act for you, and Satan will flee from his presence. In this warfare, then, what keeps us 
from being entrapped by the lusts of the soul is listening to the Holy Spirit who speaks to our spirits. And our souls then, as we submit to the Father, we live. We not only live, we triumph. Let me try and uh, let me try and give you something of a crude example of what I'm trying to say as far as the operating in the spirit within this war. My father and my brother work at Rockwell. That's an aircraft manufacturing plant uh, here in Columbus, and and they participated in the building of the B-1 bomber. Now this aircraft, in order to perform its mission, had to fly in ways that no other aircraft had ever flown. It was intended to fly at Mach 1, that's the speed of sound, and at an altitude of not more than 100 feet. And in this mission it was to maneuver around various variations in terrain as hills, mountains, valleys, and keep to its same altitude, and also to avoid man-made obstacles. For hundreds of miles it had to fly on this trajectory. Now the swept wings and other new technologies developed for this plane enabled it to succeed, but it also made the aircraft inherently unstable, so much so that it cannot be flown by the normal hand-mind coordination of a pilot. So it's flown by several separate computers that are massively parallel with each other and work in tandem with each other. And actually, two of them can override a third. It's that intricately developed. And there is redundancy and parallelism throughout the airplane. And what it does is it takes this to keep the craft aloft. It's called fly-by-wire. For example, if the pilot were to try and fly the plane on his own within the aircraft mission's parameters, 100 feet at Mach 1, his vision, his instincts, and his reaction times would be insufficient to keep the plane in the air. He would crash and he would be killed. Instead, these computers sense the instabilities within the aircraft and they sense the environment around the aircraft and they take over and make the necessary in-flight corrections for the pilot. Now because of that the craft is well able to complete its mission stay in the air and return home and through several wars it has done so many times. But the prize the winning part of this aircraft is in its very instability. Because of its instability, it can perform maneuvers that are not possible because of the stresses on airframe and pilot for any other conventional aircraft in the world. But because it's unpredictable, the enemy, they cannot figure out exactly what maneuvers it may make, where it may go. It's unseen by the radar. It flies in below the canopy. You see, my friends, in the same way as this aircraft was designed, God prepared us for battle, for the war he knew we would engage in. And the moment we are awakened by God, we step into the arena of conflict and war. Make no mistake about it, my friends. The very moment we are born again. But you see, God has prepared us for that. The ability to fly by the Spirit as this airplane flies by wire makes us unpredictable to the enemy. You see, God did give us a choice. Yes, as human beings, we have a choice, but our choice was never meant to be the choice of flying by wire and thus being governed by the world and its systems. The choice was always meant to be the choice that comes because we are flying by the control of the Holy Spirit. As we are flown by the controls of the Holy Spirit, my friends, we are totally unpredictable to the enemy, and the enemy has no opportunity to decide ahead of time what we are going to do 
and what he will do in response and more importantly what God will do because of what we do so we keep him off balance nervous and jittery which is why he hates us so but God has prepared us as instruments of war finely tuned divinely designed and when all of this matter is concluded what will be known is this that God was right and the enemy was wrong that God is triumphant and the enemy is defeated and that the Lamb the Lamb of God this entirely awkward and unsuitable creature flown by the Spirit of God has experienced a transformation in his nature that causes him to defeat the enemy on the one hand and on the other hand to be suitable through God to God as the Son of God Amen this my friends after all this was the reason that the whole thing was started to begin with <laughs> and it was the reason that God made the choice the choices that he made and in the end in the end all will see the plan of God is perfectly flawless Amen <laughs>